guys, and welcome to yet another Tinpedia book review. It's been quite a while since the last one, but let's jump right into our latest literary marvel, Knight Errant. From right off the bat, you know that Knight Errant is something different. It covers a time period that has very little known about it beyond it being a time when the Sith controlled much of the Outer Rim between the times of Darth Revan and Darth Bane. Our main protagonist is Kara Holt, a Jedi Knight who is the only survivor of a Jedi strike team deep in Sith territory. This actually brings up an interesting moment in the beginning when she talks about how she fought one of the Sith Lords himself, and all I wanted to shout to the heavens was, why can't the book be about that? However, this book does include a small section of the comic prequel about how she got into Sith space, though of course it cuts off before anything significant happens. Damn those clever marketing people. However, Every protagonist must have accompanying characters, right? Interestingly enough, there is no single antagonist. The book is split into three parts, each of which has its own antagonist and adventure. For part one, the main antagonists are the Sith Lords Daemon and Odeon, a pair of brothers constantly at war. Kara starts out on Daemon's homeworld, where she proves herself almost as soon as the cover opens by apprehending a Bothan working for Odeon who wants to sabotage Daemon's primary research facility. Instead of wussing out, Kara does the most sensible thing and detonates the Bothan's explosives anyway, along with stealing his state-of-the-art stealth suit he somehow has from the Republic. This brings up the interesting question of just what kind of scenario this book is taking place in. It actually turns out that this is just before the Brotherhood of Darkness was formed, when various warring Sith Lords controlled huge swaths of the Outer Rim, while the Republic was confined to the inner sectors. The space lanes between the two factions were almost non-existent, which perfectly keeps in canon why Kara cannot just jump in a freighter and return home. Meanwhile, after Kara blows up the facility, she discovers that the young girl she has been tutoring as a cover is actually being taken away by a large Sith corporation called Industrial Heuristics. With no job to maintain and a bunch of the Bothans spare explosives, she decides to head to Damon's main citadel. This is where I end most of my plot summary, beyond a few points at least, as I don't want to give away one of the most original Star Wars plots in a long time. However, I will say after a while, Kara meets up with a mercenary captain named Brigadier Jarrow Rusher. He becomes the second main character for most of the book, from approximately the final third of part one on till the end. Part two brings our heroes to the planet of Bailura, run by a pair of pre-teen Sith Lords and their scheming advisor. Part three has Kara and the crew of the Diligence, Rusher's ship, end up in the company of a Sith lady named Arcadia Calamondra. All I can really say about her is she would get along very well with Data. The reason I really don't want to give any plot away of especially part three is because these are some of the most shocking revelations in this book that I have not seen in Star Wars books for a very long time. It's starting to come through in Fate of the Jedi, but really this is some of the best Star Wars writing I have seen in a very long time. John Jackson Miller the author of only the Lost Tribe of the Sith ebooks up to this point did an absolutely incredible job. This book seriously makes me consider picking up those ebooks, something I never would have considered before. However, I would love to see more from this author. I really hope that he continues going with these Star Wars books. He seems to have an incredible mastery of the Star Wars material already, and I can't wait to see what else he can do with it. Speaking of characters, it's finally time to analyze our heroine, Kara Holt. Throughout the book, Kara is the epitome of the Jedi Knight. She is caring, skilled in combat, determined, and dead set on her course. It's very interesting to note how Kara is more or less the final result of the transformation Luke seems to be undergoing in the Fate of the Jedi series, because she is so sure of who she is and what she must do that it's a complete refresher from the Jedi of Legacy of the Force. She knows she is deep in enemy territory and that she wants to do everything she can to hurt the Sith while still being very conscientious of the civilians and their potential casualties. In combat, she is also very sure of herself and uses no fancy or inconvenient force powers. I'm fairly certain that the only force powers she used in the entire book for combat were force telekinesis and force jumping, and they're basically the same thing. That's it. No flow walking, no shatter points, nothing. Just lightsaber skill and some pushing and pulling. 
Again, this is why Kara exemplifies the core of a Jedi. She shows mastery of her basic skills, incredible determination to do what's right, and her dead-set belief that the Sith are evil and must be fought at every turn. Although Kara Holt is definitely the main character of the book, she is definitely not the only one on her quest. Jatro Rusher is far more intricate than any mercenary character has any right to be. After Kara meets Rusher and starts to get to know him, she finds out that he's actually a huge fan of military history who is in this business more by necessity than anything else. The only way to truly maintain independence from the Sith while in their territory is to be a, quote, specialist, as they like to be called, who can move from Sith to Sith offering their services in exchange for autonomy and supplies. The fact that he's good at what he does means that he usually gets out of battles with most of his men and equipment alive and in decent shape. And now on to one of the most interesting groups of characters in the whole book, the Sith Lords. They manage to be very deep characters, and yet you can absolutely easily identify them by their traits. Damon believes that he is the creator of the entire universe, given physical form to test himself. Odeon believes that he is the destroyer of all, and this drives his followers to almost suicidal fanaticism. I won't really go into the diarchy of Bailura, because they're a very special case and you really have to read the book to understand them, but L Lady Arcadia is the queen of logistics. Finally, Narsk, the Bothan spy, is a slippery character to say the least. His true allegiances are never known until the very end of the book, and he shifts wildly from ally to enemy to neutral for our errant knight constantly. On that note, they really go out of their way to throw that line into the book. People calling her knight errant right and left, it's really kind of ridiculous. Just like in Vector Prime when they kept referring to what was going on as the Vector Prime. You just don't talk like that. In the end, I can't recommend knight errant enough. It's a literary champion from an author who I can't wait to see more from. The characters are very well written and completely understandable given the circumstances. The setting is fresh and new, the story is well paced and captivating, and there's absolutely no reason you shouldn't go out right now and grab this book, even if you're not really a Star Wars fan. And if you are, you're doing yourself a disservice by not picking it up right now. And so ends my review of Knight Errant a book that really shows how much Star Wars books still have to offer, even with Luke Skywalker's time running out fast. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed the review. This is Timpedia, and I'm going to sign off for now. I will catch you guys next time.